Okay, guys, uh, I'm Henry. I'll be your MC today. Uh, so, yep, uh, top batter, we have the mining panel. Uh, we have uh, Jamie Leverton from HUD 8, uh, Matt Williams from Luxor, and Austin Storms from Galaxy. And we'll be moderated by uh, Maz and, uh, of our own uh, Bitcoin Expo Committee. So uh, let's get started. Thank you. All right, we'll jump right in. Thanks, everyone, for showing up uh, bright and early on a Sunday after hopefully it was a fun night on Saturday. Um, but uh, yeah, so this panel is going to be about mining. As you guys know, I mean, ma mining is really sort of the foundation uh, for Bitcoin in terms of securing the network. So we're going to start with sort of the basics, and I think it will be helpful so that everyone is centered and you know, on the same page regarding the full stack of how mining works and all the different components. So Austin, you want to kick it off, and we'll go from there. Thanks, Ross. Okay, is this live? Can you hear me? Yeah. No, I didn't think so. Um, look, I'll just talk loud then. So, full stack of mining. The way that I think about it is full power transmission from. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Uh, bulk power transmission. A uh, lot, a lot of large scale industrial scale mining facilities today start at the transmission level, uh, all the way through the project substation, medium voltage, low voltage electrical distribution system, and then you finally hit the miners. Um, that's, that's the part of the stack that I think I know best. Uh, in addition to that, you have a full software stack from typically a centralized control plane on site, um, which is what directs the miners to mine Bitcoin to specific pools, undertake specific uh, you know, operational changes based on temperature of the chips, based on power prices in real time within the market that you operate in. You have this big network layer as well. Um, that's that's kind of the I guess nuts and bolts of most mining operations today. Uh, you've also got large mechanical systems, but most people really just want to talk about the ASICs uh, and what what the machines look like. Uh, I think we're in this weird three nanometer uh, reality now, and so you've got you've got machines that have somewhere between 300 and 500 ASICs on them uh, today being put into production by Bitmain and MicroBT. And that's what really does the mining uh, at, at an individual level within these large scale facilities. We operate a 200 megawatt facility in ERCOT, uh, which is the Texas market for electricity, um, way, way out west near Lubbock. And we currently run like 55,000 machines on site. And so that's a brief, broad brushstrokes overview of the big pieces that go into some of these large scale operations. Yeah, you can really think of a Bitcoin mine as an industrial scale data center. It, it essentially looks like a data center, except that there's no redundancy built in. Often you're building in containers um, and really you're just trying to, uh, to put as much power as possible into compute um, and strip out all of the other kind of CapEx or OpEx wherever possible to just to get your lowest cost to mine a Bitcoin essentially is the game. Great, Matt. And uh, Matt, that's one of the other pieces like pools. You want to touch upon that? Yeah, thank you. So yeah, as Austin and Jamie kind of touched upon, you know, if you're a Bitcoin miner, either it's small or very large here, you, you start off by acquiring ASICs, you get hosting and, um, you know, maybe you install firmware. But when you think of a miner of any size, you're you're basically sitting there and you're trying to solve blocks, right? And, and a lot of this has to do with luck and probability. Um, luck meaning, you know, what is the probability, I'm sorry, probability meaning like what are your chances of solving that block? So if you're an individual or solo miner, your probability is like a lottery ticket. You're very unlikely to solve that by yourself regardless of how much hash rate you have. So what you do is you join a pool. Pool helps you with your probability pool takes on that luck risk for you, and they essentially give you um, a more predictable revenue stream for your mining. So I work for Luxor, we operate a very large mining pool, um, and the way that you can kind of think of a mining pool is you put your hash rate on the pool, we buy the hash rate from you, and then we give you what's called a full price per share. So basically what that is, you can look at it, there's this concept called hash price. Hash price is the expected revenue that you can expect to earn from, say, one petahash of hash rate. So on a daily basis, you can think of that in terms of USD or BTC returns. So it's been super interesting, actually, when, so when you look at hash price, because it's extremely volatile. And the reason it's volatile is because the inputs that go into it. So the inputs are 
the block reward, which we talked about a lot yesterday, um, Bitcoin price, network difficulty, and transaction fees. And so those all combine to form a methodology that says on a daily basis, you're going to get X amount of dollars or X amount of Bitcoin um, from the amount of hash rate that you have on that pool. Very cool. And then so when we look at those pieces, right, in terms of, you know, ASIC layer, actual mining companies and pools, you know, this one of the big things, obviously, about Bitcoin is decentralization. So where do you think the sort of the vulnerability points there are on the centralization side across that, the, that you know, stack layer? I'll start, with, yes. I'll start with this one. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> if, if you look at pool distribution today, I think Foundry USA pools running roughly 25% of the total network hash rate. Um, I think Ant pools also roughly 25% of the total network hash rate. Yeah, that's right. Two of them is north of 50. Yeah. yeah. And so I, look, there's, there's a significant amount of uh, concentration risk at the pool layer. Um, that's nothing new to Bitcoin. We've seen that time and time again over the last, uh, you know, call, call it six or seven years. Um, you know, in, in terms of mining companies, I don't think there's much concentration that's happening at mining companies. Even some like the largest miner in the world, Marathon, I think they have like between 25 and 30 exahash total uh, operationally and probably in boxes waiting to be plugged in. Uh, it's, that's only today l less than 5% of the total network hash rate. Um, we were looking at it before before we hopped on the panel, and I think network hash rate on a trailing basis is around 633 exahash, uh, which is an, an insane amount. I remember uh, after the China ban, it was much, much lower than that. It was uh, 90 in July of 2021. Yeah, and so we, we're kind of seeing we're kind of seeing some hockey stick growth on network hash rate. I don't, that's why I don't think that there's much concentration risk at, at the mining company level. Um, Really, it's just pools, and and, and the the what one piece, ASICs? yeah, the one piece that people don't really talk about is the, from the manufacturer side. Bitmain, Bitmain is kind of had a monopoly on the space, but you can argue that there's been a duopoly with Bitmain and MicroBT over the last five years. I, I think Bitmain still controls roughly sixty to seventy percent of the production of the ASICs, um, but there are some companies like Aradine that are that are raising capital and and producing machines, uh, uh, but at a, at a much smaller percentage because they're still pretty new, so, yeah. And just with respect to mining pool concentration, the mining pools aren't overly sticky. Like a, a, a miner can move their hash rate very quickly, very easily, which also kind of reduces that, that concentration risk, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent point. Um, miners can pick up and move at the drop of a hat and a lot of that, I mean, I think it works to the miners' advantage because they can, you know, play the market, go to wherever the best pool is based on the pool fees or, or you know, the brand of the pool. But yeah, I think that removes the vulnerability. And that wasn't the case. Like even four years ago, we would contract with pools. They would be long-term contracts. You would have, um, you would have more concentration risk before than you than you do today. And I think a good example of the ability for miners to move quickly off of a pool. Do you guys remember when Poolin started having some issues and then yes. they were they were having liquidity issues and they started issuing IOUs to their clients and their clients within like an hour moved that hash rate off of Poolin? Um, yeah, it's it's if if you if you stage the pool request, uh, I mean you can you can merge into prod and, and change pool configurations within five minutes and that's that's kind of what keeps pool operators honest, I think, these days. The customers can leave at the drop of a hat, and, and they all know that. Yeah, and most pools will pay out hourly or daily, and so you're not really incentivized to... There's no stickiness because you're not keeping capital or leaving capital on the table. Yeah, so we'll come back to some of the more interesting pool dynamics in a bit. But before moving on, uh, on just to finish off on the ASIC side, why, why do you think the, you know, the monopoly or duopoly has persisted? Why do you think... It's hard for startup, you know, ASIC manufacturers to penetrate this market. I mean, we've seen them come and go really consistently. There, we've probably seen twenty startups come and 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 not ultimately survive. Oridine's kind of the latest. They're they're probably the best funded that we've seen in a long time. A really good founding team out of out of the West Coast. So you know, reserving optimism that they may be the the ones to kind of break through. Um, but historically, capital has been has been a challenge. Um, getting getting enough silicon on the line with TSMC, like, yeah. it's a game of scale. You can't really make money if you're only producing, you know, sub 100,000 machines. 
And that's unfortunately what we've seen with the, with the other startups. They, they've just never been able to hit scale. They've never had production capacity that ultimately translated into a viable long-term business. Yeah, and they can't compete on price. No. Without scale, there's, yeah. you can. And do you think it's because of the ASIC nature of the chips, as, in, as opposed to general purpose CPUs or GPUs, as in it's only SHA-256, right? So it can only do one thing. So it's hard that you can't scale outside of this industry. Yeah, I mean, I think it's because of the application-specific nature of the underlying algorithm itself, but then it's also incredibly capital-intensive to tape out, like, to tape out wafers and produce yeah. <laughs> produce chips at scale. Um, and so, like, Ardines, they're they're very well funded at this point. I think they just raised an eighty million dollars Series B within the last two weeks. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, it's capital-intensive, and the 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 expertise to take to take a piece of silicon and OEM it is pretty few and far between even today. I remember when Intel Intel was doing their block miner. Um, there, I think there were four or five companies that they they signed agreements with, and I'm not sure if I know I know one of them has OEM'd it and put it into production, but I think the other four have kind of floundered in that effort. Um, and so capital intensity, and then having the expertise uh, in-house to, to actually OEM something is, is pretty difficult. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. So, um, so moving on, you know, a lot has happened in the last couple of days. Obviously, there was something called a halving that happened. Uh, so uh, yeah, Matt, this is probably like Matt's favorite subject of the last <laughs> few hours. It'll be my uh, favorite to not talk about it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Well, now too. we have all the answers, so it's better. That's true. We don't <laughs> have to talk about what's going to happen. But, but actually, so well, before we got here, we were like, if nothing happens, we're not going to talk about it. But something did happen. So uh, that is worth talking about. So uh, Matt, maybe you can kick it off. Is there a specific aspect you want me to talk about or just transaction fees? Yeah, yeah. Let's, and I mean, hash I think, rate. And hash rate. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, so let's start with hash rate. So network hash rate is how much hash rate is out there in the network trying to you know, solve blocks. And we've seen, as we mentioned before, we've seen this steady spike in hash rate over the last couple of years, and it's just been going up and up and up. And as that goes up, it becomes more difficult for miners to mine, which hence the term difficulty. Um, historically, over the previous three halvings, you've seen a, a pretty tremendous drop in hash rate, network hash rate, after the halving. And that's because the, the block reward is effectively cut in half, and it become, miners become unprofitable or on our prep call last week, we were predicting what hash rate would be immediately post having and debating whether it would be 40 or 50% fall off immediately post, because that's what you would generally expect to see. Yeah, historically, it's been somewhere between 25 and 40% post having. Now, I think we had a different viewpoint at Luxor just due to well, what we saw in this having was unprecedented. We saw a run in Bitcoin prior to the having, um, which I think made it so their miners had a much bigger cushion in terms of profitability leading into the halving. So a lot, you can think of miners profitability, they have what's called like a break even hash price. So basically the amount where they become unprofitable with their machines. And so, you know, let's just throw out like a kind of a, a middle of the round number of like say $50 a pet hash. So leading into the halving, we were at 105, you cut that in half, that's 52. Now everyone's kind of, you know, on the brink of unprofitable. However, we had that huge run up in Bitcoin and then we had these transaction fees that occurred. So basically, miners were all profitable and we've seen zero drop off in hash rate post having, um, which is unprecedented. And, and in fact, we are looking at a difficulty adjustment where we're gonna see an increase, a small increase in hash rate post having, which has never happened. N never come even remotely close no one, nobody could have, would have, or did predict an increase in hash rate and difficulty post having. No, even people that were, you know, bullish on this were predicting, you know, we were three to seven percent, not two percent increase, <laughs> which is crazy. Um, but I think the other piece that you were alluding to is the transaction fees. Yep. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of talks yesterday about the impact of transaction fees in the space, and you know, as each uh, block reward gets cut in half, they become more and more important. Well, we saw some pretty interesting activity over the last 24 hours um, with transaction fees. In fact, we saw a spike that was, um, I don't know if it was exactly unprecedented, but it was, it was huge. At, at one point, um, 
it was 30, what is it, 37 Bitcoin was the block reward, which is absolutely absurd. Um, and a lot of this had to do with what's called runes. So runes are um, effectively they're NFTs that, that take place on the Bitcoin uh, network. And so there was a number of projects that launched and effectively in order for these to launch, you have to ramp up transaction fees because it's a competition for block space. And so we saw this tremendous, and we're still seeing the aftermath of it, tremendous increase in transaction fees, um, which in turn makes miners much more profitable. Albeit, you know, it's starting to tail off today. Um, transaction fees are dropping, but I think our floor is much higher than it used to be, which is a good sign for miners. Yeah, awesome. What do you think? Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I um, my previous role, I left Hot8 a couple of months ago, but... I uh, was the CEO there for over three years. And as a, the CEO of a large publicly traded miner, the question I would get day in and day out would be, well, what happens when the block reward goes away? Like, what is your long-term business model? And in the, in the early years, transaction fees were, were minuscule, like 1%, 2% maybe, really not enough to sustain an industry growing at the rate that our hash rate is, which means the rate at which our industry is. So when ordinals started picking up steam last year, and then and then now what we're seeing with runes, it's it's exactly what we hoped and prayed would happen eventually that transaction fees um, would increase to a level that it could make the case for a long term viability of the industry well past the last uh, Bitcoin coming into circulation, which will be in 2140. We'll all be dead. Um, but still, institutions and investors really, really cared about um, understanding the answer to that question, which we now have incredible momentum around. The problem, though, even with that, is ext it's extremely unpredictable and volatile. So transaction fees could be anywhere from, as you said, you know, 2% to, as we saw, <laughs> 900% of the block reward, and, and it's it's extremely volatile and unpredictable. So as uh, we, Austin and I were talking about this in the walk here, as a miner, as you're modeling out transaction fees as it relates to your revenue, you still have to assume a pretty low floor in order to, you know, to be accurate. Because it could be anywhere from, you know, 7% to 40% on a given day. And so I mean, modeling that out to your board or your shareholders could be extremely difficult. We never modeled it in. We always took transaction fees. Again, it Which wasn't they weren't that big, uh, but you assumed that as upside over and above what you were getting from the block reward. But just to keep it conservative, you model based on block. Are you modeling transac transaction fees in now? Really, really small amounts. Yeah. So when we when we underwrite forward projections, I think this year we did somewhere between three and seven yeah. percent on average for the entire year. Um, but <clears throat> look to Matt's point, and it's it's very volatile. Uh, the volatility is something that you take advantage of when you can. Um, but I, I expect as transaction fees become a larger part of the total block reward, as the subsidy starts to dwindle, we'll see, we'll see latent compute, like miners that are running in, in solar or wind deployments uh, that come online to take advantage of some of that volatility once, you know, over the next decade or so. But right now, Everybody's minting ordinals, which are really, you know, ordinals and runes are like a rendition of colored coins. Nothing crazy, nothing really new there. Um, but people like to buy them, I guess. So We're actually working on, just due to this um, exposure that miners have and other people have to transaction fees, we're working on transaction fee derivatives. Oh, really? Yeah. So the ability, it would give the ability two things. One, for miners and other people that are exposed to transaction fees to hedge against their exposure. And two, to gain exposure to the space directly just to transaction fees. Yeah, and on that though, I think it's kind of interesting because to your point, I mean, right now, whether it's ordinals or runes, these are just NFTs, color code, like derivatives of that, right? But to the extent, I mean, we have a panel, I think coming up later on like L Bitcoin L2s, when to the extent that there's much more functionality potentially enabled through any one of these L2 projects, do you think that stabilizes a higher base rate of you know, transaction revenues as a component of the overall block, block reward? Let me make sure I understood your question. <laughs> yes. So a as as more layer twos come on, do you think that the more functionality, fees, yep. there's more usability on the base chain exactly. when they peg and peg out? Probably. Um, but I I would say as a, as a miner, you know, we we run roughly one percent of the total Bitcoin network today. Um, we don't count on that because L twos and and their interaction with the base chain, kind of where we get paid, 
is again volatile just like ordinals or rooms or anything else that's happening um how, how we like to position it is if there were no transaction fees and people stop using bitcoin for a year and it's just the block subsidy where do i exist on the cost curve relative to our industry peers um and that's 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 the credit underwriting exercise that we take for our own business yeah yeah so then I guess this also, uh, Matt, you, you were mentioning a very interesting subject. I mean, in the Ethereum space, as you guys know, there's this concept of MEV, which is you know, minor slash maximum extractable value. Uh, it's obviously that when there are transactions, that starts becoming relevant. Uh, it has not been relevant in the Bitcoin space, but uh, Matt, you use an interesting term on our call, mempool sniping. <laughs> so uh, is that the beginning of potentially MEV on Bitcoin? And what are the implications of that? I mean, people have been talking about MEV on Bitcoin for a long time. Um, it's just before ordinals wasn't a reality. Um, the concept of mempool sniping, <laughs> albeit I'm not an expert on this, I can kind of give a high level of it. Um, so basically mempool sniping is a concept of someone buys um, an ordinal in an ordinal marketplace. So they buy an NFT in the ordinal marketplace and then it enters the public mempool. And then someone uses a process called replace by fee or RBF to effectively snipe that transaction into their wallet. So basically you'll have people buying ordinals in an ordinal marketplace and people that are more sophisticated and willing to pay higher transaction fees will snipe those and, and basically steal them into their own wallet. So this is a concept that's been occurring for the last couple of weeks. Um, and it's driving up transaction fees as well in addition to the other things that are going on. So I don't know if that's exactly MEV per se. <laughs> it's maybe a little bit shadier, but... Um, <laughs> But I think what's interesting, you know, this is bad. I'm like, I'm not a huge fan of runes or, you know, monkey pictures on the network, but like it's driving innovation. And I think you'll see a proliferation of, you know, other layer two, um, you know, projects that are a little bit more interesting and expanding the Bitcoin utility and giving a higher floor of transaction fees, which is going to be super important for miners and securing the network. So, yeah, I think maybe like early days of MEV, but... Uh, I don't think we're there yet. Any yeah, thoughts? and to add, to add on to that, like I, I think one of the one of the most interesting things that I've seen over the last call it eighteen months with with the ordinals and and now the runes is you know in, innovation is messy. It always has been. It likely always will be. Um, when when we see things happening on the base layer of Bitcoin that some people like, some people don't like. Uh, I think sometimes we forget that the, the the practice of building something from from scratch from from nothing and really moving from zero to one that usually doesn't happen in the public eye, and that usually doesn't happen in the public eye in a very technical space. Uh, we're we're seeing it happen in real time, and everybody is watching. Uh, and Matt and I talked about it on the walk over here. Like I I I expect there to be weirder things happening on the base chain. Uh, over the next four years to decades, um, and this is kind of just the start. But as as part of the innovative process, like it's it doesn't surprise me. Um, it doesn't surprise me in the slightest, and I'm happy to see it. Yeah. Well, that's what I was gonna say. I think it's so exciting that we're seeing all of this proliferation of innovation coming back to the to the Bitcoin blockchain in a way that we haven't seen in probably a, a decade. Um, and I think. This might be controversial. We probably do have Ethereum's move to proof of stake in part to thank for it. Bitcoin's the only proof of work um, chain out there. Proof of work is a feature, not a bug. And people want to build on proof of work and therefore Bitcoin. Yeah, and just to add one more thing to that, like I think it is, you know, the, these new innovations are bringing new users yeah. to yeah. Bitcoin and, and driving more innovation that way and, and broadening our exposure to other people that would have you know, been stuck on Ethereum. No offense, Vitalik. No offense. Yeah, so then the other sort of uh, connection point to this potential MEV stuff is um, at, the, at the pool level, right? So I don't know how many of you know, but uh, there's, the, without using all these acronyms, the point is a lot of these pools subsidize miners um, because without a consistent payout, the economics of mining are very difficult. You could hit a bad rough patch or a bad luck patch, and you may not hit a block for a long time. So these pools finance these miners and provide this you know, steady stream of income. Now, Matt, I think there's potential changes coming around to that. 
related to you know potential things that we talked about like mempool sniping and others but i was curious if you could just provide some of your thoughts there well they don't do it out of the goodness of their heart exactly <laughs> that's not a yeah, volunteer not a free program service. <laughs> That was mean. I thought you were the nice one. <laughs> and you know I love you guys. Um, she's right. We don't do it out of the kindness for her. We do it because we'd like to make money. But however, um, you know, like at least at Luxor, like the mining pool no longer is our, our main source of revenue. It, it's more of like a, how do we bring miners into our ecosystem? Um, but to answer your question, you know, the miner pool payout has evolved over the years. Right? And there's been several iterations of it. The most recent being, well, not most recent, but the most widely used is FPPS, which I talked about earlier. Um, the downside to that, actually, from the pool side, is that we do assume luck risk. Yep. And so what that means is if we go you know, several days or a week without solving a block uh, and getting the rewards, we still owe the miners that are on our pool their payout. So... So we take we assume that risk. So we have to keep Bitcoin on our balance sheet and pay that out. Um, and there could be times where it's very sparse and we're paying off our balance sheet. And there's times where we solve a lot of blocks and everything's great. So, you know, you know, from a from a miner's perspective, I think you know it's still pretty good. I think there's room for innovation. And I um, Austin and I differ, differ on this, but I think we'll see an evolution of that PPS into something different soon. Um, there's a couple ideas that are floating out there. Ocean's got a new um, payout scheme that they're using. Um, I don't necessarily agree with, but yeah, innovation's coming for sure. Is it at three months or a year? I'm not sure, but I think it's probably coming pretty quick. I th I'm, uh, the thing that Matt and I disagree on is that I think it's coming in like three months. Um, I when, think it's longer than a year. When, when, you're, when you're a pool that's taking luck risk, uh, and you hit a bad patch, like you said. Yeah. You have real liquidity problems, yeah. and we've seen we've seen some research done on on these these Coinbase transactions from the different pools that go to a shared custodian in Kobo. And there's likely one financier behind the FPPS structured payouts. Um, I, I think the the FPPS structure is going to change. I mean, look, I, I talk with Nick about this all the time. Nick Hansen, who's the founder of Luxor, um, and it's it's going to change. But it, it also presents some issues for miners on the other side of that who have you know, re removed the variability in payouts by taking on this FPPS structure and are participating in you know, different uh, electric grid, uh, call, it, call it power trading or arbitrage opportunities. Um, because now, you know, depending on how that structure changes from the pool's payouts perspective, you may have some variance in payouts where you, you can't normalize your Bitcoin revenue on a dollar per megawatt hour basis, which is what grid operators and electrical utilities, uh, that, that's, that's their like base unit that they use. And so it's, it's gonna be interesting to see, I think uh, depending on transaction, vol transaction fee volatility is gonna drive how quickly pools need to change their payout structures. But I think, uh, I mean, since, since the Bitcoin block of what was it, 840,000, like, it's been volatile. <laughs> well, th that is true because if you miss, if you if you're not solving blocks and you have this crazy transaction fee on top of it, like you still owe that to your pool participants, right? So, th I think the difference is like if you're a mining pool that's not well capitalized, yes, you're taking a lot of risk and you could be insolvent and then be in big trouble. So it, it's a capitalization thing, but you're right. Like incentives need to be aligned a bit better, and I think that will drive the the change. It's going to be a real problem for public miners, though. FPPS makes life so much easier for public miners when it comes to how they work with auditors and, and yeah. regulators. Um, it's They're going to really, really, really struggle to move off that predicted um, revenue model. That's actually a very interesting point. I didn't consider that. It's, the it's going to be a massive problem. I mean, yeah. I, I spent the better part of last year with right with um the sec and regulators and that's that's one of their biggest hang-ups is our relationship with pools and the and the predictability of that payout do you think that drives public miners to um to run their own pool like like marathon i mean it could right now most of the space uses fpps because that's right. the cleanest easiest way to do it um i think 
I, d I haven't parsed through Marathon's regulatory filings in any detail. I don't know how the SEC feels about them running their own pool, whether they like, like it more or like it less, but it, it may drive miners to have to do that if FPPS goes away. That, that would create a real problem. All right, so I think we only have a few minutes left, but before going to sort of Q&A, there is, you know, there's, in the last few minutes, the word risk was used a lot, right? And uh, you guys know in, in sort of you know, economics, there's a concept of like complete markets where you can hedge every risk. So I'm curious, what's the state of innovation with regards to hedging, you know, the various inputs into the mining operation, whether it's electricity, hash rate, talking about transaction fees, it seems like there's a lot brewing there. So maybe we can just cover that briefly before opening up for questions. I'll start with power because that's what I know best. Um, look, I, I think miners historically have taken index exposure or spot exposure in these deregulated electricity markets, and many of them have not hedged their forward power costs. Um, with, within the ERCOT market in Texas, there's various shapes. There's on-peak, off-peak, weekend, uh, weekend shapes that trade. They trade, on, uh, they trade on CME, they trade on ICE. Uh, there's a little bit of collateral requirements for some of that stuff, but I, I think as sometimes a lot, a lot of it, yeah, it's like 300 <laughs> a grand a megawatt, which is just an insane amount um, to to tie up and get you know, Fed funds rates. Yeah, because mi miners don't have enough demands on their capital. Right, exactly, and so I, I think historically miners have miners have ridden ridden index or real time spot price exposure, um, but as we saw in 2022 after Russia invaded Ukraine and Henry Hub gas went from two or three dollars to eight to ten dollars uh, with, within a very short period. Those have real impacts on the underlying electricity costs and miners, if they're being prudent risk managers, should be hedging a large portion of their forward costs relative to like, like what is it, 85, 90 percent of your operating expenses every month? Uh, yeah, it's just exactly. electricity. Yep. So that's, that's what we, we look at. And then Matt, you've got, yeah. Yeah, I think just taking a step back, I think it's important to look. Miners have three main risk exposures. There's the power costs, which I agree with Austin is probably the most important thing to tackle first. There's your treasury. So most miners are what's called hodlers. They sit on a pool of Bit or a pile of Bitcoin, and they have USD price exposure to that Bitcoin. And then lastly, they have their revenue, which is the hash price that we mentioned before. So fluctuations in Bitcoin price, transaction fees, and the block subsidy all impact minor revenue. Uh, historically speaking, miners haven't really hedged any of those inputs. Um, this is kind of a new concept to the space. I, I would say people are ramping up quite a bit. Um, my team operates uh, several forward markets to basically tackle the, the hash rate exposure they have or the revenue for their hash rate. So we operate uh, forward markets that allow people to lock in their hash price for a given amount of time and size. We're also launching a futures contract on um, a regulated exchange as well this month. Um, but yeah, so, but, you know, there's lots of derivatives for, for Bitcoin to manage your Bitcoin exposure. There's lots of ways to manage your energy exposure. And more recently, there's hash rate derivatives as well. But it's still a space that's not what I would call sophisticated when it comes to hedging. Um, yeah. They are ramping up. People are hiring the expertise they needed, they need. Um, but it's still it's still a very new concept to the space, and I think it's important to recognize that the mining space itself is like less than a decade old, right? And like it's people that were building around technology, not necessarily like financial instruments. So, but as c competition increases and the block subsidy keeps going down, it becomes more important to manage your free cash flow and have revenue, per, you know, predictability. So, I think you know hedging instruments will be much more prevalent. It's just like any other commodity space. Yeah. You know, take oil and gas for example. You know, most oil and gas producers will hedge, you know, 60 to 80 percent of their their production. Yeah. And, you know, and that translates into better financing and, you know, more predictability. And if you're a public miner, better, you know, valuation on your stock price. Like, it's all good things, but it's not sexy by any means. And it doesn't really jibe with the HODL culture. Well, the, the space has completely changed as well from a macro perspective for publicly traded miners. First publicly traded miner was Hive that went went live on the TSX Venture in late 2017. So like well inside a decade old, the space. Um, but historically, we did have the opportunity to hedge um, all kinds of different exposure.